Phil's uh, intent there was to prove that our pre-cooler technology, which obviously the company's been developing for many years, was capable of achieving this breakthrough of, uh, of high-speed flight capability. So yeah, we really wanted to put it through a proving program where we subjected it to the you know, the temperature threat levels that it would see at very high speed you know, in the atmosphere. To do that, we had to build a unique facility that could generate that sheer amount of heat that energy that's required. So take us back a, a few years. You did a, a very similar test, didn't you, in the UK, but that was at temperatures that are very much lower, a sort of ambient type temperature, and, and you really needed to, to go to a, a different regime, a higher regime, in order to make that next check on the technology. Yes, that's right. So a few years ago, we uh, successfully demonstrated the pre-cooler from ambient down to cryogenic temperature levels, which basically proved out the fundamentals of that technology and confirmed that it was good to go. And then really the next step beyond that was to take it to this regime of supersonic and hypersonic flight, which demanded higher inlet temperature capability. So as we want to do as much of our proving as we can on the ground and not have to go to flight unless it's absolutely essential flight being you know, extremely expensive activity and classically the way in which high speed development programs have been undertaken, we made the decision to build a facility that replicated, you know, simulated those conditions on the ground. So it was a pretty big step for us to take. We, we did look at existing facilities around the world uh, most notably in the US, but we just couldn't find anything that was capable of, uh, of doing that job. So going back to the British test, you had a, a Viper engine, didn't you, that sort of sucked air through the pre-cooler. How have you done it in America that takes you to this new regime? You're absolutely right. So the, the test in the UK was Viper, you know, pre-cooler on the front of a Viper engine. The Viper's job was just to suck the air through a fairly high rate. So in the US, we've actually, if you like, you can imagine we sort of flipped that arrangement. We've now got a, a fighter engine, ex-fighter engine, a much larger engine, much higher thrust capability that's generating our, you know, which effectively is our heat source. So that's generating the quantity of high temperature gas that we need and obviously is uh, highly flexible in terms of uh, we, can, we can dial in you know, any temperature we like really and we can simulate everything from ground to ultimate flight conditions and back again within that single system. So we've got that attached to uh, plenum and then we have a test leg that's tapped off that and the gases are directed down that test leg and through our pre-cooler. The pre-cooler sits within a high temperature housing and there's an amount of ground support or ancillary equipment that's needed to feed that with high pressure helium, which is the coolant, and, and then to dissipate the heat energy because it's, you know, Ultimately, it's megawatts of heat energy that's being transferred in that experiment. So the experiment is stepwise, isn't it? You're going up through the speed and heat levels. Where have you got to so far? Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's stepwise in two senses. So it's uh, stepwise in the sense we're building up progressively to ultimately a hypersonic flight case, so beyond you know, Mach 5 and beyond, which is a very extreme temperature threat level which can really only, only be generated by something like the burning thrust of a military engine, <laughs> which is why we've picked that particular device as a heat source. So it's stepwise, in a sense, we're building up to that point. And currently, we've achieved uh, high supersonic, so we've achieved the equivalent of Mach 3.3 conditions, so as fast as SAR-71 Blackbird in temperature levels. The other way this is stepwise is, is, is really the point I referred to earlier. You can take the device through a simulated entire mission, you know, from static on the ground, building up through the temperatures, which will be equivalent of in increasing the speed, you know, holding at the ultimate speed point and then bringing it back down again. So it's, it's really, you know, hugely capable and flexible facility for proving out not just the pre-cooler, but any number of systems that are going to find themselves in that, that sort of environment. Uh, and you need to get to uh, a simulation of above Mach 5, yeah? Well, ultimately, I mean, and to be honest, that's not, that wasn't the sort of cardinal um, purpose of this experiment, which was to get to high supersonic. But as, you know, frankly, the device has you know, performed so well and met, if not bettered, our expectations, then our intent is to sort of push beyond that and go to that, that much higher temperature level. I mean, the job of the pre-cooler is to dump all of, of the heat that's coming 
You're, you're, you're doing that, yes? I mean, that, that heat is being dragged out of stream and taken away. How quickly? Well, we're, uh, near instantaneously. Uh, it's, it's absolutely uh, you know, quite remarkable. I mean, we're now able to prove many of the claims that we've been making as a business, um, backed up by data, which is very high quality, but we're you know, near instantaneously in this last experiment transferring you know, one and a half megawatts of heat energy equivalent of a thousand homes worth of heat energy and if you take it to its full temperature level you know the, the mac 5 plus case that becomes you know several megawatts because the temperature is increasing exponentially or at least the square of the velocity so it's quite an extreme now in, and in the test setup what we do with that heat energy is yeah we, we take it to a, a large boiler and we dissipate it in that manner but if you were to have this free cooler in a saber type system then that energy would be utilized within the machine in a regenerative way you know, the key principle uh, in the thermodynamic principle of a saber engine is you utilize that heat energy usefully so. and just to reiterate why you're doing this if you're going to travel at those very high speeds and and you take the air in and then you know you have to slow it down compress it to, to use it in the engine it would get even hotter wouldn't it unless you somehow manage to take all of that energy out absolutely right it gives you the ability to punch through the heat barrier the heat barrier being the really accepted recognized almost literal barrier to hypersonic flight and causing immense challenges on the industry in terms of how you break through and sustain flight at those threat levels so it gives us the ability to punch through the heat barrier manage that heat very effectively in a you know what is actually a remarkably lightweight and compact device so it's generally is a sort of breakthrough technology yeah because otherwise you'd have to i don't know resort to exotic materials or something wouldn't you exactly right so you, although you could cope with that temperature at the inlet you're absolutely right as you start to force it through a compressor then and it gets hot even hotter then it, you will ultimately reach materials limits and yeah absolutely right we're trying to avoid having to go for those even more exotic materials that are hard to find you know the, the journey to a new super alloy for a, an engine can be a 20-year journey from the test tube to application so if you can avoid having to go there then that's that's a good thing yeah. and then at the same time uh, you've just had a design review haven't you on the core of the the saber engine which is i guess your next big british experiment yeah, absolutely right. So I think you're yeah, absolutely delighted to have gone through successfully the preliminary design review on the Sabre core demonstrator, and that's I mean, a really big achievement of the team and to the delight of the space agencies, both UK and European, and uh, it puts us on a good path to actually start to go and build that demonstrator and have it on a UK test bed next year. What's the hope here, Mark? I mean, when you reach certain milestones, then I, I guess investors take increasing interest uh, if they see you operating in a much higher temperature regime which you're now doing in these uh, u.s tests then you may you may get a few more phone calls yes <laughs> yeah yeah i think well absolutely right i think you know within the industry and i think it, i think it's well known that we're we're undertaking this test program and i'd go as far as saying that people know what they would do with the technology should it prove to be successful so this is a big step in that direction um yeah, I, I honestly think this has wide application, not just in the immediate obvious domain of high-speed flight, but across, you know, more widely across aerospace industry and in, into more commercial applications, anywhere where there's a significant heat management or energy management challenge and you're looking for ultra-lightweight, miniaturized, highly high-performance solutions, then I think we have something to offer. So there'll be people that'll look at this with the key objective of hypersonic flight in mind, there's others who will probably see those other connotations or adaptations of the technology.